Hello everyone. I hope everyone's been doing well. I've been on somewhat of a hiatus recently from interviews. Recently I moved to Tampa, Florida and I don't really know anyone down here yet. So I'm extremely excited to be back. Last weekend, I drove up to Tennessee to visit my friends Frank and Kayla. Frank and Kayla are engaged, and between the two of them, they have a lot of information on areas of physical and mental health. So we got a lot of content. You can be expecting a lot more episodes coming up over the next couple weeks. I'm going to start putting all their episodes on our Patreon account early. So if you want early access to any of those episodes... You can subscribe to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash drivefitness. This interview is going to be with Frank, and by the time I release this episode, there will be another episode available on Patreon as well. So if you really enjoy the episode, be sure to go check out the Patreon account where you can get his second episode ahead of time. Frank Morazzo is a friend that I made freshman year at JMU where he studied psychology Right now, he is studying to be a clinical mental health counselor at Lipscomb University. Frank and I discuss many topics such as mental health, psychology, changing your behaviors and habits, and meditation. If you guys want to support the podcast, please check out our merchandise at drivefitness.app slash store. Frank also produced the theme music to the podcast that you're about to hear right now. How you feeling? You nervous? Super nervous. You excited though? I'm very excited. Frank's first podcast? It's been, what, eight months in the, in the making? Mm-hmm. Something like that? I'm taking your podcast virginity, man. It's very exciting. It's scary. It's very scary. As you said, this is the next uh, rock star. or the next rock star. This is the new rock star right here. <sighs> this could be the beginning of something crazy. It's know? already, man. We're just... I'm trying to ride the wave, you know? <laughs> It's all about riding waves, or starting waves, if you can. Kanye. Hey, Mr. Ye. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Yeezy. Mr. Yeezy. Keep it easy. (laughs) You better keep this part in. Can you tell us a little bit about what you studied in undergrad and what you are currently studying in grad school? I originally went, we all went to JMU. I was studying originally computer science, but then changed over to psychology. Pretty big shift for a lot of people. Definitely gotten a lot of questions about that over the years because it, it's completely different fields, completely different way of thinking about things. But I definitely feel like it fits more to how I see the world. Like I, I think computer science is cool because it's really problem solving oriented and all that. But I really like psychology because it's, it helps me understand people mm-hmm. and it really helped me understand myself a lot more. Um, it kind of got me on this journey of being self-aware and thinking like, okay, why do I do certain things? You know, what types of genes and um, like what kind of habits have been given to me from my family mm-hmm. and kind of just how I've grown up and all that. I think psychology is really cool for that because it, it just helps you understand yourself a little bit. I'm currently at Lipscomb came here because my fiance Kayla ended up coming down here and it just seemed to be a good fit. It was like everything just kind of came together, which was weird because, you know, for a lot of big decisions, I really tend to overthink them. But this just seemed to be everything hit. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like I didn't even think about it twice. I was like, this school is cool. The teachers are really great. Seems where I need to be. And it's been an incredible fit. Like, so what's the name of the school again? Uh, Lipscomb University. Lipscomb University? Mm-hmm. Okay. And what is your field of study called specifically? The full title is a clinical mental health counselor. Okay. Once you get your degree, what kind of career does that set you up to have? It's kind of a broad, that's like, like, you know, social work, you can kind of do a lot of things with that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of similar. So I could do marriage and family counseling or just personal therapist, Mm -hmm. online therapy, there's any really sort of counseling you can do. I think I'm leaning towards a more one-on-one type of counseling because I just really like talking to people and just really sitting down and being like, how are you doing? Like, what's going on? What, you know, what do we need to work on? How can we get you to that place that you need to be at? Would you go work for someone else when you graduate? Or is the vibe you basically start your own practice and then you have your own clients? Then you yes. start gaining your own clients? Or are you going to go through a period where you work for someone else and like help them with their clients? 
what people tend to do a lot is go work for a company initially and then after five years open your own practice okay. if that's what you want to do do you i need, think that's my goal personally mm-hmm. do you need to go get like a phd or something before you open no. your own practice you could that you'd probably get you know a higher salary it looks better um you can do more research based stuff with that mm-hmm. which i love research and i would love to participate more in that but i don't think i could do any more school after this Mm -hmm. At least not for a while. (laughs) (laughs) But you would be qualified then to have your own practice, right? You you don't, no more school required, right? Yes. Okay. So the way it works is you get your degree and then you have to pass, it's like our entrance exam, whatever it is, um, to get your licensure. But until you do that, you have a temporary license for a few years. So you technically couldn't go out on your own initially. Mm. Like you have to work for somebody to get a certain amount of hours to then get your license. Okay. So it's it's like you have school, practicum hours, and then postgraduate, you still have to get more hours towards that. What's the license called again? So it's different for each state, but technically I'll be a licensed professional counselor. Okay. That's like awesome. the official title. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a step back to like undergrad and just psychology in general. In your own words, what is psychology? What does psychology mean to you? Oh, a good question to me psych is it's a very ambiguous term Mm -hmm. because there's so many different branches of psych so like you have your neuropsychology which is more on like the brain and how different neurotransmitters work together Mm -hmm. but then you have people who just study human behavior the way i think about it is just a combination of like how humans interact with each other and kind of why we do certain things if Mm -hmm. that makes sense So I like to study like, you know, what makes somebody go do something? You know, I go to my job every day and I do it, but why do I do that? Mm -hmm. You know, what's kind of my motivation for that? So are you more interested in like, oh, this part of the brain sends a signal to here and that makes me do this? Or are you more into like, oh, these behaviors over time cause someone to feel this way or have, you know, this disorder or... I feel like they're both super important and Mm -hmm. it's hard... Like, I know people specialize in both of them, but for me, it's hard to take that out of it, if that makes sense. Like, I'm more of a a holistic Mm. type of person, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I like to think about, okay, how does how you think affect how you feel and what you eat contribute to, like, so there's so many different factors to that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, like, the actual brain chemicals going on, which is going to affect how you feel. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, your thoughts are also going to affect that. But then your behaviors are giving a feedback mechanism to how you think. So Mm -hmm. there's there's so many things at play that it's really hard for me to kind of break it down to one thing. Okay. You know, I like to think about the whole person and how every single thing affects who they are Mm -hmm. and what they end up doing. Yeah, all the different systems at play from like interpersonal relationships to mm-hmm. like chemistry in your brain exactly. to genes that might have been passed down to them. All that needs to be considered before you make any analysis on anybody, I guess, right? Yes. Yeah. Which is hard because we like to make snap judgments as humans mm-hmm. and we have to, to a degree, mm-hmm. like for survival, you know, it's just there's so many people and that we don't have time to break down every single person and be like, all right, I understand everything about them. You know, mm-hmm. it's, we have to, like, we've gotten so used to these snap judgments just because our world moves so fast. That's what we have to do. And that's why I like to work with clients because it helps me. Like I get to sit with one person for an hour every single week and get to know everything about them. Mm-hmm. You know, they tell me things that they don't even tell their wife or their husband. Mm-hmm. It's like, I get to see, that side of people that they're afraid to show to other people. Mm-hmm. And I've had that side of myself before. So it's, it's really like when people are courageous enough to be vulnerable, mm-hmm. it's, it's cool to um, be able to, you know, help them through that and mm-hmm. that they're actually um, open to that, you know? Yeah. That's kind of intense. Like it kind of reminds me of like a priest back in the day, right? People are just dumping all their problems on you. Yep. In a normal conversation, when someone opens up and becomes vulnerable to me, my first instinct is to kind of reciprocate and be vulnerable back. But in your situation, you—it's not about you, right? The whole session's about someone else, so you 
kind of just have to take in all that information. You aren't, it's not a give and take. Like right now we're having a conversation. It's, it's mm-hmm. like, you're just consuming it all, all about analyzing them. it. And what do you do t- on, on your end to shift through all their pain and problems? The first thing they told me in grad school is every therapist needs a therapist. Mm. And that after, I think I started going back before this semester started Mm -hmm. and it has been life changing Mm -hmm. because I always knew I needed it just to have that out in myself, Mm -hmm. but to actually go and do it, it's a complete, it's night and day, Mm -hmm. you know, it's the difference between taking in so much and just feeling so overwhelmed by it. And like, Cause you really, you start to really care about these people mm-hmm. and you take on their emotions cause they're mm-hmm. literally unloading everything on you. And then you come home and it's like, you start, you're thinking about them. You're worried about them. You know, you're like, I hope they're doing okay. And it's like, that's really good, but there has to be a boundary somewhere, mm-hmm. you know? And that was, that's still something I'm figuring out. You know, where is that line? Having somebody to outlet that myself has been like I I don't know if I could do it if I didn't have that so you're always like listening right and you need basically to be heard sometime you need to have your outlet you need to have just someone in your life at least one main person that's listening to you taking in your problems as you take in like all your clients problems right yes Mm -hmm. interesting yeah it's it's weird because we don't especially as therapists we're so used to doing stuff for other people like literally our whole job is okay I'm gonna give my full attention to this person. And they, like you said, like there's not that reciprocation. It's so different from most relationships that we have that if you're not super intentional about, you know, taking care of yourself through that, nobody's going to do that for you. You know, you have to be, they, they preach self care really hard in our um, graduate class and you don't realize how important it is until you're in it. And you're like, um, I need this, you know, like I have to take care of myself or else I'm going to burn out. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's, it's something I care about. So I, I want to keep doing it, but you realize that like there is, it can be really serious after a while and can really start to get to you. So like you have to put those systems in place now so that you're ready for that long haul. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. No, it makes complete sense. You told me you listened to my last ep- uh, podcast episode, right? I did a book review, and part of that book, it was talking about the feeling brain versus mm. the thinking brain. Mm. And basically, the book was kind of claiming that the feeling brain kind of runs the show, right? And, you know, the thinking brain is kind of in the passenger seat of the car. Yes. And you got to kind of communicate feelings to that side of the brain, mm-hmm. you know, in order to actually change your behavior. And then I was wondering... Like, as far as the brain goes, is that thinking brain our outer layer, like our cortex, and that feeling brain more of our, the inner layer? I forget what that part is called. Is it, is it, is it probably not so black and white like that? It's, the brain's complicated because there's little parts that you can break down that are, they clearly perform one part, Mm -hmm. but they're also so interconnected that they each kind of play a part in things. Okay. So, like, amygdala is um responsible for a lot of the emotional stuff Mm -hmm. and i mean that plays with a lot of different things but it's really interesting what you're saying because that just got me thinking about just the there's always this argument that logic rules right we should always go by the logical way but we're really emotional creatures you Mm -hmm. know we like to think of ourselves as super rational and always basing decisions based off logic and reason And, you know, there's part of our brain that does that and that's great, but really most of us are driven by emotion. Mm -hmm. It's emotion first and then kind of that reasoning second. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why we see Twitter and Facebook fights that are super emotional. It's, that's what engages people, that emotional drive of just like, you know, when you get so overwhelmed by something, it's, you're not thinking rationally anymore. Mm -hmm. We, we like to think that most of our decisions are based off, you know, really thinking everything out. And it's just not true, unfortunately. So is that part of therapy? Is that like getting more in line with your emotional side and just mm-hmm. to just first understand or acknowledge those emotions? And then how does that play into the therapeutic process? Okay. Like so acknowledging that your emotions are driving you. 
So it, it's really just getting people to, I think a big part of it is accept a lot of those emotions. Um, because for so many of us, certain emotions are unacceptable, you know, especially for a lot of guys feeling sad or it's like our acceptable emotion is anger. You know, that's the one outlet that we're allowed. But as humans, we experience so many more emotions than that. So when we, when I'm working with a client, especially a guy, it's trying to get him to understand that those emotions aren't bad. You know, it's not you're a bad person because you feel this way. Mm -hmm. It's more, why are you feeling that? Is it, what is this trying to tell you? And how can we process this and kind of move past it? So if someone's like angry all the time and say you figure out that they're angry about like school, mm -hmm. would you maybe help them channel that differently and be like, hey, we don't have to get mad at school. We can get like sad about school or ch let it challenge us. Or is that how you you help people channel things a different way? Or is is it like, no, it's okay to be mad. Like, let's just understand why we're mad and just deal with that emotion as is. I see what you're saying. I think it could be a little bit of both. That That's where it's, it's tough because each client is so yeah, different. Case by case. Yeah, yeah. It's, we have the saying that, um, you meet the client where they are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could come in with all this educational knowledge and teaching them why the brain makes them feel the way they are. You know, that might be overwhelming though. Exactly. Yeah. It's like you can come in with all these facts and really just be like, this is how it is. But if they're not ready to make that change or to deal with those emotions, you can't just press them on that. You know, mm -hmm. you got to kind of figure out how much are they ready to handle and you know, how, how can I push them today? That's not going to push them into that over where well, you're overwhelmed and super stressed and not really thinking anymore. Like you want to get them just to the point where it's uncomfortable mm -hmm. and they're forced to acknowledge those feelings, but not to the point where they just shut down. Okay. So it's kind of an art of finding that balance, you know? So you just said like sometimes people feel super stressed. I feel mm -hmm. like that's a good thing to talk about. Yeah. What is your perception of stress? How do you cope with it yourself? How do you suggest that other people cope with stress? I feel like that's a big just topic all around. Yes. That uh, society is facing right now. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I've always... I don't want to say I've been against stress, but in my own life, I've tried to minimize it as much as possible, mm -hmm. almost to avoid it to a degree. And I've started to realize recently that that's not healthy. It's stress really does have a functionable aspect to it. You know, if I, if I didn't have that stress, I would just sit on the couch all day and play video games. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of need that boost to be like, all right, go get your homework done. You know, go work on your business, go make some music. It's like, you, we kind of have this weird relationship with stress where we're afraid of it almost, you know, it's like that bad, like, oh, you don't want to get super stressed and you can get too stressed. It's it, again, it's that balance of like, you need enough stress so that you're not apathetic, mm -hmm. but not too much that you're just thinking about everything and not doing anything to handle it. So for my personal life, I really try to emphasize taking time to myself which is a concept that was really hard for me for a while. You know, I really like to give my time to other people and it's, it's hard for me to set that boundary of like, okay, I need to take care of myself first. It's like that saying, um, you know, when you're on an airplane, you put your own mask on first if it's going down. It's, I was living the opposite for so long of, I was trying to take care of everybody else. Mm -hmm. And then I was running my own self. I had no fuel left. You know, I was stressed out because I wasn't taking care of myself. So that really got me to a point where it's like, all right, this, I'm not going to be able to take care of other people if I don't take care of myself first. Mm -hmm. So that, that got me to, um, you know, start eating healthier, just try to sleep more. It's, those are the most basic things, but they have the craziest impact. You know, such a little thing as actually getting seven to eight hours of sleep. I function so much better mm -hmm. and I don't, it's like, there's always going to be those stressors. So doing those things to put yourself in the best position to handle them, I think is, that's really all we can do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we're ever going to hit 
a complete zero of no stress. Everything's great. Mm -hmm. That's just not realistic. So it's, it's kind of just being aware of like these stressors are going to keep coming. It's not, I, cause for me, I always wanted them to stop coming. Uh -huh. You know, it was like, I just want my life to be good. I don't want to have to deal with this, but it's not that I, like, I, I changed my mindset on that. You know, I don't want it to be that I don't experience stress, but that I have the strength to kind of go through that and can mm -hmm. manage that effectively. Yeah. In that book that I was just talking about, they talk about pain, how you can't mm -hmm. really escape pain. Yeah. Right. And I feel like stress is a huge type of pain right the biggest yeah so i kind of see those are the same you can't escape pain you kind of have to pick your own pain right yeah and i f as i was looking back on that review i feel like i missed an opportunity which i'll say now which is if we have to pick our own pain right we can't avoid pain in general exercise is like a great way right to go yeah. through some sort of pain and or stress right mm -hmm. and i don't know therefore you're kind of picking your own pain or picking your own stress. I feel like the worst kind of stress is stress that comes out of nowhere that you can't handle. No control. Whereas if you are choosing to work out every morning and going through a stressful morning because mm -hmm. you chose to, yeah. the other pain you go through might not be as bad. Same thing with that time to yourself, like a meditation or something that might, people don't like to be alone with their thoughts. That is pain. That is to sit alone with your thoughts for 20 minutes might be the hardest thing for somebody you know yeah. so by choosing to do that you are putting yourself through stress first mm. right and maybe it makes all the other stress easier is that something is that a theme that comes up in your uh in your education or in your practice with people is diverting stress out like a, through other avenues you know i don't know if we've ever talked about it how you just described it but i really like that idea mm -hmm. because it it goes back to that kind of sense of control. It's like we feel the most stressed out when we don't have control over that situation. Like I always notice when I really start to get stressed, it's almost I can't identify what the stressor is. Mm. Does that make sense? So it's like maybe I go on Twitter and something gets me all emotional. And then I start thinking about some bills I have to pay or, you know, some assignment that's due. It's and then there's all these different thoughts and I can't identify, okay, which one do I have to deal with to decrease the stress? Yeah. With something like fitness, it gives you that control back. If life's going to be hard, I might as well do everything I can to have full control over this. Yeah. I've, I've never thought about it like that, but I, I think that's a really interesting concept because it, it's like you said, you can't get away from stress. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like life is just like, you're just cruising. That just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So we might as well figure out something to at least take ownership of that and do, do something about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So looking back towards like the history of psychology, right? What is one of your favorite psychologists and mm -hmm. what impact did they have on the field of study? So I would probably say Carl Jung. He, he was in like the fifties and sixties. He basically put forward the whole idea of the shadow self. It's pretty big now. It's he's kind of a either you love him or you hate him. Mm -hmm. He's he's kind of controversial with some of his stuff. So basically his main idea was that to be whole, you have to have you have to integrate your lighter and your darker side. So um, there's actually a quote by him, which I really like. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. And I mm. really like that because I think that highlights a huge misunderstanding we have about enlightenment or being whole. You know, I think we're all searching for that feeling of feeling whole and complete, but it's we almost look for it in kind of synthetic ways, if that makes sense. So it's mm -hmm. like he was basically saying to be a full human and to be true to yourself, you have to acknowledge that kind of darker part of yourself that you really don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, we all have those either lazy habits or, you know, those parts of ourselves that were kind of like, uh, I don't really like that. You know, that makes me uncomfortable. But he's saying that if we're going to be, genuine we have to acknowledge that part mm -hmm. you know we can't just 
you can't just be super happy and positive all the time. It's like you have to deal with those negative emotions too, you know? And I don't even like the word negative because I think they're both just two sides of the same coin. It's just they feel bad, but I think they have equally as important teachings in them. Some of those um, kind of darker moments in your life or would end up being some of the greatest catapults, catalyst, you know? Like I think back to um, some of the most stressful moments in my life and they forced me to deal with so many things that I didn't want to deal with, but I needed to. You know, it, it made me grow in ways that I never would have grown if I didn't face that stress, if I didn't deal with that. When you're talking about like the darker side of things, I can easily pick out like the darker situations or things that have happened to me, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this dark, this bad thing happened to me. I turned that into a positive, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Yay. But I have a hard time like reflecting and picking out like the darker parts of my character, you know what I'm saying? That's mm. a scarier thing to look inward on, you know? It's really easy to be like, life fucked me up over here, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, because it's, it's like the blame is off of you. And I'm pretty good at turning a bad situation into a positive. But how do I look inward and figure out the darker parts of my character and like who I, who I am and how do I turn those into positives? Or is it better to just deal with those demons and work around them? It's really uh, not a long process, but it's not like an overnight shift. You know, I really wish it was to be a lot easier. For me, going to therapy really helps just because it's a safe place where I can express those darker sides of myself comfortably mm -hmm. and process them together. So um, that's why I really just am in love with this whole field because it gives people an opportunity to express something that they may have been holding in for years mm -hmm. and just never or comfortable enough with somebody to do that. Basically, a lot of stuff um, that Jung talks about is if you don't deal with those darker sides, they're gonna show up in other ways. Mm. You know, so um, for me, for example, I'm really bad at expressing myself. So whether that's anger, um, any sort of confrontation with people, I really, I don't know how to do it well. So I bottle up so many emotions as a therapist, it's clearly not good. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not what we're supposed to be doing. But it's crazy because it always comes out eventually. And when I bottle it up for so long, it all comes out at once in the worst way possible. Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe I'll just explode on somebody that it wasn't even close to whatever they did. Mm -hmm. You know, the magnitude of my reaction was way over. But it wasn't just because of that one thing that had been building for years potentially, you know? So it's, it's like, if you don't deal with those things, it's not like they just go away. Yeah. They just find other ways to come out. You know? So you weren't good at expressing things. So you had to get better at expressing yourself mm -hmm. quicker. Right. Yes. So you didn't use that darkness as a positive, right? Mm -hmm. You tried to fix it or something. Once I started doing the podcast, I realized, I'm not a very good listener, right? I usually just talk a lot, you know, at people and I don't even like while they're talking to me, I'm usually just already thinking of what I'm going to say next, you know, mm -hmm. and the podcast really made me be like, oh, I need to listen more. Yeah. But it wasn't like I leaned into that darkness and was like, fuck it. I always have something more important to say than people, <laughs> you know, like I had to deal with that and change it. I feel like at times I could be a little e egotistical or I could be a little superficial. What should I do with those darker parts of myself? Should I be less egotistical, but maybe then I wouldn't be pushed as hard to like start my own company and be successful. Should I suppress those things or should I? No. What do you do about what? Well, so what do I do with that? You know, that's the interesting kind of way of his philosophy around all this. It's not repressing or suppressing it. It's acknowledging it and kind of like you were saying, figuring out, okay, how does this fit with who I am? You know, how can I, this may seem like a bad thing, but like, can it be a good thing? Mm -hmm. You know, could this possibly be something that drives me or um, like for me, could it help me speak up for myself more? That's clearly not a good thing to do just to bottle things up. But when that's your natural way of dealing with things, that's just how you do it. Mm -hmm. But kind of digging through that, it 
it's basically like you're like for me when I think about it I'm going to go through more uncomfortable situations because of dealing with that you know maybe I'll express myself more and that will make people uncomfortable but in the long run it just feels healthier like I will be more okay with myself because I won't be building things up and letting emotions just kind of slowly grow inside of me like I'll feel more at peace with myself and I feel like other people will respect that I actually said something and mm-hmm. I spoke up. Searching through those things and acknowledging them, does that sort of help take the blame away from like you being that thing? Because I feel like, remember, mm. remember I was saying, if a shitty thing happens to me in life, I really clearly see how I can turn that into a positive, right? Mm-hmm. But with something like, I don't speak up for myself or I'm egotistical, there's so much blame and guilt to that darkness of you, right? That it's... it. It hurts. Is part of it sort of treating it like a, a life situation? Like, oh, life just made me egotistical. That's just happened to me. Kind of disassociating yourself from that darkness so that mm. you can That's you can deal saying. with it without hating yourself, you know? Yeah, where it's not so painful that it's kind of unbearable. Yeah. Um, Is that part of I'd say the philosophy? That, that right there is the art of therapy figuring out how do I help this person deal with something that's so emotionally overwhelming for them, which is why they've never dealt with it. Like, how do I go through that process and not bring them to that, like, shock state of, like, this is too much, but enough that they actually work through it mm-hmm. and experience those feelings, you so, know? So what are some techniques, then, to help someone come to grips with something without being overwhelmed? Within the therapy world, there's thousands of different theories that you can kind of base your practice on. For me, I like to take um, a kind of existential approach to it and cognitive behavioral therapy. So basically, existential is kind of, we're all going to die one day, and how do I want to make the most of this? It's kind of a a dark question, but for me, that's always been a motivator. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to make the most time of this on earth. So I want to do, I want to be the best person that I can be. And that means dealing with those uncomfortable things. Mm. It kind of blows everything out of proportion, right? Someone might come into you and be like, Frank, I'm not good at listening. And you're going to be like, well, first of all, you're going to die someday. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just start there. Just off the bat. <laughs> okay. So listening is really not that important, you know, compared to like, you know, everyone you love dying. Okay. <laughs> and then it almost like sets the stage to like, oh, okay, well, this problem isn't as overwhelming now yes. compared to that which i'm worried about but i can't do anything <laughs> about that so yeah let's just figure out my listening issue because <laughs> we can do something about that you that's know? something we have control over and then you just kind of threw in there cognitive behavioral therapy right mm-hmm. i think i know what that is but can we just dive into that what is that yeah cognitive behavioral therapy is basically getting people to figure out how their thoughts affect their behaviors their behavior affect their thoughts and how that constant cycle kind of feeds into itself Mm -hmm. and what we can do to kind of break those patterns to kind of create new ones. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, a lot of people with depression or um, something like that, really they get so caught up in their thoughts and then that triggers them feeling depressed. So then they don't do anything, which then, triggers those more thoughts of, oh, I'm lazy, I don't want to do anything. And it's just a feedback loop. You know, it just continues to go. So what we can do is we go in and we try and make them more aware of those thoughts and and just that whole process and get them to think about like, okay, how do I change my cognitions, but also change my behaviors and have the two working together rather than against each other, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So then most people go in and they're like, I feel depressed. My thoughts are overwhelming. Or do they go in and they're like, I don't do anything all day. I'm lazy. Do most people recognize that behavior issue first or their thought patterns first? And then you, or is it just Mm. case by case? It definitely is case by case. I would say, I'd say most people initially are aware of the kind of actions that come out of that. Like they know how they feel. And they've experienced those thoughts so many times that they're aware of them, but they might not realize the connection there, if that makes sense. So, like, a lot of people don't fully understand how much your thoughts affect 
your entire body, your entire physiology. Mm. So it's like when you have that negative thought, you feel that, you know, it, it goes through your whole body there. That mind body connection is real. So it's, it's really working with the whole human system, you know, not just your thoughts or just your behaviors. It's eating healthy and working out and being conscious and meditating. It's like, it's taking kind of a holistic approach, I guess you mm-hmm. could say. I feel like there's one more big factor here, right? There's the behaviors, there's their thoughts, but isn't there also their environment that's yes. going to pay, isn't that going to play just as big into all of this? Someone who came from a shitty family, their behaviors and their thoughts might all be affected by their shitty living situation. I guess that that would be part of the behavioral side. So a big part of that is structuring your environment to be the optimal, if that makes sense. You know, if I was working with a client that came from a really tough background, you know, went through a lot of family issues and stuff like that, it's first, hopefully getting them out of that situation if Mm -hmm. possible, which is kind of not really in our control, but that would be, you know, one of our objectives. Also understanding that impact that it has on them, because a lot of people hold their own negative thoughts about themselves, not realizing that it stems from that. You know, not seeing the connection between, you know, maybe your mom always told you that you're not good enough and you're not going to ever amount to anything. And it's you internalize that because of such a a rough environment, but you don't realize that that's why you feel that way about yourself. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's kind of bridging the connection between all that and realizing that, like, you know, not only how you think about yourself affects you, but also what everybody around you is telling you you know, your comfort level in that area. Mm. It's humans are really, really complex beings, which is why I really like to just sit down and get to understand that. We like to make everything kind of black and white, but in reality, it's never that simple. Mm. One of my favorite parts about my degree was it was an interdisciplinary uh, degree. Mm -hmm. So instead of like studying physics, it was like a broad range of sciences that I studied. And it really gave me a systematic view on things, show the connections between these sciences and these things. So if you're having a problem like, okay, well, let's think about my internal body functions. Let's think about the friend group, the network I have. Let's think about the economic system that's also playing a part here. Let's, you know, Mm -hmm. let's think about all these different systems that play a role, right, with a problem. And for me, it was usually problem solving, like an engineering problem, but... It sounds like for you and therapy and psychology in general, it's really about parsing out all these different systems that play into this interpersonal problem. Yeah. Both on like the molecular level and in the like all the way up to like the giant societal issue. Right. I mean, someone might be stressed out about our political climate, you know what I'm saying? All the way down to their bank account, you know, and all these things, all these things play into a factor. So you got to, parse them all out slowly right before you can even begin to attack any one of them right yeah it's a it's really interesting you say that because i'd say in the past 10 years maybe we've seen kind of a shift towards that we've always been aware that we get affected by systems and kind of just the society that you're in at large but recently with kind of feminist theories and more kind of structurally focused theories even if that's not what you're basing your practice off of we were kind of taught to just consider all of that you may be a woman that is in a poor community may have a completely different experience from some male that never really experienced financial difficulties or there's just so many different factors outside of just who they are that tend to get overlooked sometimes. I've noticed that in my own therapy, like I would, we'll kind of talk through things and I realized that so much of what was happening politically was affecting me emotionally. And if I didn't work through that with my therapist, I never would have made that connection. You know, I was just stressed and I thought, oh, it's because I'm in grad school and, you know, I'm doing all these other things, but really and those played a part but it was just this feeling of like you know what's going to happen with the election there's there's just so much going on that 
it affects you and it's almost like we don't acknowledge that a lot of times you know everybody's like oh we're all going through it you know just accept it but it's like kind of affects us more than we realize a lot of times you know Mm -hmm. for someone who's like emotionally stable do you think that it's possible for them to kind of take a step back and go through all these different factors and kind of get to the root of their problems on their own or do you think basically for anybody you really do need to sit down with a therapist and kind of work these out with someone who's unbiased and can look at your life objectively? I think that's a good question because I think there is a general misunderstanding of that. Like my personal belief is that I don't think therapy is necessary. I think you can get there on your own. That's just kind of a tool that for people that are completely like have no idea where to even start that can kind of give them that little push, you know? So um, I don't think therapy is the only way, but I do think that for a lot of people, it's just a great place because so many people are so out of touch with how they're actually feeling, whether that's being boggled down by the daily stress of your job or your finances and never really having that time to take that step back and really think about things. Mm. So that therapy is such a good avenue just to get people thinking like that, you know, just to kind of start to foster that self-awareness and just kind of get people on that process, Mm -hmm. which, like I said, I don't think that's the only way you can do it. I think there's millions of ways to that kind of self-growth, but that's for a lot of people, I think that's a great option. Yeah. Like I could easily see how talking to a friend or someone could help you work through some of these problems the same way. They might not know exactly what you're going through, but it might be mostly the process of just telling someone, Mm -hmm. giving you just that moment to reflect on what you are actually going through with another person. Uh, I feel like another good way might be like keeping a journal, right? I know people that keep a journal. It allows them to obviously take a step back, reread and think about what they're going through. Are there any other ways for someone who might not have access to therapy that you think is a good tool that can help them kind of work through some of the problems they're having in life and kind of view themselves a little bit more objectively without someone? I think there's tons of different routes. So that kind of depends on what you're drawn to as a person. For me, for example, my other outlet is making music. That's my time to think about how I'm feeling and how can I get this out? Mm. You know, what different combination of sounds can I use to it, to feel like I expressed how I was feeling? So um, journaling, I also think is a great one. I try to journal probably a few times a week. And I feel like, like if you don't have access to therapy or anything, I think that is a great starting point for a lot of people because that so many times we don't even notice those thoughts that are going through our minds. And a lot of times it's the same thoughts over and over. So once you write that down, you start to see those patterns, then you can kind of say like, all right, this is clearly a theme that keeps coming up in my life. You know what I want to do about it. But it's for a lot of people, it's just that starting point of even that awareness of how they're feeling, but also exercises I think is a huge one. That's different because you're not really expressing that but i know for me when i get like really angry and i don't know what to do with that if i go to the gym and put on just some like aggressive kind of music it helps me kind of get that out any sort of movement i think too it kind of helps you express those different feelings that like when you're still all those emotions are just running through you and when you put some type of movement to that you kind of feel through the emotion Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. It's like dancing or yoga. Um, It's just a different way to feel and express that. Hmm. When it comes to working out, right, and using that as a form of therapy, I've had it explained to me, and I've kind of experienced this in my own life, where it can feel like your problems are kind of stacked on top of you. And then when you work out or go through some physical sort of challenging Uh, like exercise or something, those problems that are stacked like on top of you, they kind of lay out, right? And they kind of Mm. feel, you can kind of imagine them in a different space than 
if if when you're just living your life, right? Like, I think maybe it has something to do with the fact that when you're working out, you just can't tackle those problems in that moment, you know? So you probably usually feel like you got to do something about these problems, whereas almost anything that forces you to not take action on them allows you to take a step back from them and kind of really yeah. view them, which is maybe one of the most important things about therapy is that you're just literally forced to be in a room thinking about these problems instead mm-hmm. of actually doing something about them in that moment, you know? Yeah, it's it's interesting you say that because it, it kind of reminds me of that. Like, you know how people always say that breakthrough moment comes in the shower or when they're going for a walk. Mm. It's like, I, I've noticed that too. Like if I'm stuck on a problem and I'm obsessing over it and then I finally am like, all right, let me just, this isn't working clearly. Let me take a step back. It almost comes to you. You know, it's like you were trying so hard to force that. And then when you kind of were open to it, instead of putting all your energy into figuring it out, it's like, then you're, you're kind of in a state where you're more curious about things. Mm. You know, it's not as much of, I need to figure this out. Like that kind of forces stress. Whereas when you're in a more curious kind of open-minded state, your things kind of come to you a little more naturally. It's kind of like that meditational state where you're more open to the possibility of things and it can show you that maybe the solution was completely different than I imagined it before. But if I didn't take that step back to even consider that, I would just be looking at the same thing over and over. You know, you got to kind of look at things from different angles just to reimagine the potential solutions to those things. I do find that um, just keeping an open mind does help me, right? Accept all of like the different possibilities and situations and really, really kind of see all of my problems and everyone's problems from everyone else's perspective and, Mm -hmm. you know, really kind of taking that holistic viewpoint, right? When tackling my problems. But uh, I think it's great that we offered some people like alternatives to therapy, but a theme that I've noticed kind of shift throughout my life is that when I was a kid, you used to go to therapy if something like bad happened to you, if you were mm-hmm. messed up. And I feel like there's been a shift in our culture in the past, maybe three or four years only Yeah, where there's this attitude like, no therapy is for everyone. You know, therapy is kind of like brushing your teeth. You know, you should do yeah. it once a week. You should go in, you should emotionally cleanse yourself or work, just be working through your problems what do you think about that shift in our culture? Do you like, is that exciting for you? Do you think that you, would you recommend anyone, even if they don't consider themselves like emotionally disturbed to seek out therapy and you think it could have benefits for literally everybody? I am absolutely thrilled that this is becoming a thing because it's, it's weird that for so long we've paid such attention to physical health. It's always been, you know, eat your vegetables, work out, get a good amount of sleep Um, which is super important and we need to do that. But only recently we've kind of begun to acknowledge that mental side of things. And I like to look at everything as connected, like that mind body connection. So it, you can't have really good physical health without really good mental health. Um, so I think it's amazing. I I think it's really been a long time coming for this. Um, but to your other question, I do think therapy is for everybody. I go to therapy on my own. I wouldn't say I have any super crazy problems or, you know, anything that's like life detrimental or um, I just feel like therapy is a space where you can feel like yourself and learn about yourself in a safe environment. When we're out in the world, it's like, you're constantly facing challenges and everybody's kind of looking out for themselves. So therapy is the one place where it can be all about you. And for a lot of people that, that may be the only chance that they get that, you know, for me, I, I'm somebody who doesn't really open up to a lot of other people about that. So therapy is the one place where I can completely focus on myself. And like you said, I really like that it's shifting from kind of the stigma of like, you have to be messed up to go to therapy you know there has to be something wrong we all have something going on you know whether that's financial issues or family problems job don't you know whatever it is life's really stressful and i think it i don't think it would hurt anybody to be open to that potential Mm. 
Yeah. Well, how do you feel about introducing medication to a patient? Mm -hmm. So I feel like the first step should be like, let's try to work through your problems verbally. Let's try to figure out. But how do you feel about medicating like issues like depression and bipolar and schizophrenia versus living with that, working with that? Because a theme here seems in, in our society seems to be that Yes, certain people need medication, but there also is a bunch of negative side effects to these medications. And it, like I was saying, everyone's different. But yeah, how do you feel about just medicating people for, for their mental health? If you had asked me this question two years ago, I would have probably said I was super against medication just because I always kind of I was feeling what you just said where. You know, I thought you'd go to therapy. There's just so many other ways. But now I've kind of come to a point where I realized in certain cases, medication is necessary. Like, let's say um, for schizophrenia or somebody who is seriously depressed and they've been to therapy for a year and they don't really see too much change. Or even medication with therapy a lot of times is effective. I agree where I don't think medication should be the first thing you know i think all things should be considered first especially like the kanye situation i think is really interesting mm. because his bipolar symptoms clearly mess with him a little bit you know he clearly struggles through that but it also gives him this insane creativity i it's hard for me as somebody who's a musician but also a therapist to say one way is better or worse you know it's like i think a lot of times medication can be super helpful but i also think like you said there are so many side effects with it that we should be really cautious about just handing it out mm -hmm. you know i i do like i said there are a lot of cases where it's very necessary but i, I think there should be so many other factors considered especially when i think about add and you know these kids that like seven years old, getting prescribed Adderall and stuff like that. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad because I think it does help a lot of kids, but I also think that can kind of foster a certain dependency. And, you know, when you're so young under these intense chemicals, once that starts, it's hard to get back from that, you know? So in those certain situations, I think a lot more factors should at least be considered before that's just the, that, that shouldn't be the default, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that sparked two interesting thoughts in my head. One, in the Kanye situation, it does feel like he should be allowed to have the choice not to take his medicine. Mm -hmm. And maybe someone with a different career path who's not an artist, who's maybe like just an engineer, is going to want to medicate. And yeah. maybe that's, it, that's why everyone should kind of be allowed to choose. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of curious, well, when... When is the point where you can't choose? I guess you probably mm. have to put you or other, someone else in harm's way. Yes. But is there like any signs ahead of time? Like this person's looking like they might do some harm here. I'm pretty sure the rule is someone has to actually do harm to, you know, to themselves or others. And then they lose the right to choose to not or, or to be on medication. Not necessarily the action of doing something, but expressing intent to do that. So if I was in a session and somebody was like, after this, you know, I'm going to go kill my friend or something like that. It's like, I would have to take action at that. Yeah. You know, I couldn't let them leave that. I, a lawsuit could come at me later because I didn't do something about mm. that. It also makes it tricky though, for people to open up because yeah. those people who are thinking about killing someone probably need a therapist the most. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when it really comes down to it, like a therapist I guess you can't be trusted with that information because they're going <laughs> to tattle on you, you know? <laughs> I'm going to tell. Yeah, you snitch. That's, uh, that's actually the first session that we have. We go over uh, the confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So that's basically laying down, like, if you tell me you're going to harm yourself, others, um, minors, older people, there's, like, a whole list of, like, if you tell me any of this, I have to take action about it. They try to set up an environment where 
you at least know what you're getting into. It's still tricky because like you said, why would I tell you that I'm gonna do that if you just told me you're gonna report on me? Do you think that prevents certain really extreme people from working through certain problems because they don't wanna tell their therapist they've had like suicidal or like murderous thoughts? Definitely. Um, if So if it was something in the past where they felt, you know, three months ago I wanted to do something, but I didn't act on that and now I'm not really feeling that right now, you know, then we could work through that. Yeah, but isn't someone who's having murderous thoughts in the moment, like the the person you would want to go help more than anyone else in society? Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And they probably feel like they can't tell you, you know? That's the tricky thing about all of this. It's you want to make people feel comfortable to really express themselves and like the, you know, those dark thoughts. But there's also that professional responsibility part of it too. It's like we have a responsibility to society to, if we know somebody's dangerous, to do something about that. But like you said, it, it makes it so muddied of the people who might need it the most might be missing out on this, mm. you know? So I don't really have a solution to that, unfortunately, but um, I think that's definitely some conversations that need to be had about, you know, how do we actually effectively work with those types of people? Because like you said, I think that's who needs it the most, people who are really struggling with these super deep and just violent thoughts of wanting to harm somebody else, that's... Clearly, there's something going on if you're feeling that. You know, that's that's my job to help with that. But there's the other side of I got to protect you too, you know. I don't want somebody that's told me they're going to hurt somebody running the streets. It's a gray area for sure. My last thought or my second thought about medication is that I have some problems with it. And I feel like the best mindset to have towards medication is like here's this medication to kind of turn your life around or like if you're at a low bring you up to a high or maybe if you're at a manic high bring you back to homeostasis right but then to get off the medication and Mm -hmm. for two main reasons one is you mention it because of like dependency issues no matter what the drug is it's not going to be good for this person to be completely dependent on it Mm -hmm. especially if there's side effects but then also the thing that bugs me is that It's a business. Like the pharmaceutical industry is a business. And I feel like we've made a business out of preying on people's mental health. The need to continue selling them a drug might override their actual need for the drug, you know? Mm. So I don't know. That's 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 personally the issue that I see with medication in society is that even before day one of taking that medication, there should be like an exit plan set up. Let's do this for three months. Kind of like when you break your arm and you go on painkillers. They're not just like here's painkillers for the rest of your life. Like if you're clinically depressed, okay, let's get you on the depression medication to turn your life around, but let's get in plan like ahead of time. Once your life is starting to turn around, like let's get you off of this so that you're not dependent and you don't just become a consumer of this industry that really it, it's almost unethical, you know? That was actually, I think my main problem with medication to begin with. It just felt like, we kind of substituted that for any other potential solution. That was like the first, like, oh, they have depression, just give them some meds. And like you said that there's so many factors that go into that. There's clearly an interest financially and that can kind of get muddy where, yeah, it does a good thing, but how much is too much? Like when is too long? And when is that incentive to keep selling overcoming the need for that person's health? It's almost like to stay in business, there always has to be some sort of issue. You know, you could make the same argument about counselors. Like we, there has to be people that are depressed for us to be in business. We like to say that if, uh, if we're doing our job, eventually we'll go out of business. It's kind Mm. of the running joke for our community. (laughs) Um, (laughs) that makes me feel a little better about it. I've really struggled with that for a while because I am a part of that now. And it's my responsibility to kind of take that seriously. I can't prescribe medication. Only a psychiatrist can do that. But, you know, I can refer somebody to a psychiatrist and kind of yeah. keep up with You can with start them. putting that thought in their head. Like, exactly. you might need medication, right? And mm-hmm. that's almost as influential as a person that signs a paper, if not more. Yeah, especially when, you know, I'm the one sitting with them through all their deep, dark thoughts. If I give them that uh, idea, they're really going to take that to heart. 
Mm -hmm. So I think as counselors and just anybody working in that kind of mental health field, it's really up to us to be really intentional about how we go about that. Trying other ways of kind of dealing with that. You know, I don't want to say it's a last case resort, but it shouldn't be the first case resort. Mm -hmm. You know, I do think medication can help a lot of times. But like you said, I think we need to be more intentional about the long-term plan because sometimes with medication, it's very short-term focused. You know, let's get your dopamine up a little bit. Let's deal with this issue right now, which can help some people get there. But then, like you said, that dependency starts to form and that can create a whole another cycle of issues. So our goal is to not just replace issues with more issues. You know, it's to actually effectively deal with those issues. Medication's a very gray area for yeah. a lot of our field. <laughs> I'm throwing some rough topics at you right now, but I appreciate you're it. You're doing great. All I right, think look. this is what we need to talk about, you know? Oh, for sure. We've talked a lot about mental health, and if there's any topics that you want to touch on, let me know. We'll swing back around to it. But I kind of want to talk about how psychology affects other areas of health as well, because mm. Personally, like I'm always looking to improve myself, right? And so I want to work out better or more. I want to eat healthier. I want to live like a healthier life. I want to be more successful. And whenever I'm like going to like read a book, I find myself always going towards like a self-improvement book or a psychology book mm -hmm. instead of like a nutrition book or a fitness book. Mm -hmm. And when I take the step back to think about it, like why am I attracted to those psychology books? when psychology is not really even in my like domain. And I, and I come to the conclusion usually, for the most part, it's psychology that's holding me back. I know that drinking soda is bad for me, but I still do it, right? It's not really mm -hmm. my lack of knowledge about soda that's mm -hmm. the problem. It's my behaviors, right? And breaking yes. that behavior. I did recently read a book about habits and kind of behaviors and how to fix your habits, how to make them healthier. And one of the things that they said is there's like these three steps. There's a cue, there's a routine, and there's a reward, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so a cue is what triggers, right, a craving or something that you have. Then you do whatever routine it is. So for me, it would be like drinking the soda. Mm -hmm. And then the reward is like the sugar that I get and the that feeling I get. The dopamine feeling. And so they say that these like habits are kind of like in your brain like grooves in your brain right the more mm -hmm. you do something the more it kind of like wires your brain that way the best way to like change your habit is to replace it so mm -hmm. like a very simple version of this is i used to drink a lot of coca-cola and recently i just switched to drinking sprite right but mm -hmm. i use the same cue whenever i want a coke now i go drink a sprite you know and then i get you know, whatever reward it is from the sprite and like eventually i probably want to step that down and do like sparkling water or something mm -hmm. but if i were to just try to quit sodas, then I would probably go back to them in like in a week or something. Cause I, I still have that groove in my brain, right. That kind of set me in place for that habit. I'm going to talk to uh, your fiance, Kayla about nutrition, but that's one of the main reasons I want to talk to you first, right? I wanted to kind of get people thinking about psychology and their behaviors and start to realize how they can make changes mm -hmm. so that when she gives us a bunch of information, right. Mm -hmm. That, is used to implement those changes, they, they have already started thinking about how they could be shifting their behaviors or, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Or their habits or just have that ability and that knowledge. So is there anything that you find very helpful regarding anything like in fitness or nutrition or just certain like habits or you know, behavioral psychology that it, it can be useful to people who want to like make a positive change in their life? Yeah, um, I'm really glad you brought this up, actually, because that's been a big part of my own journey, trying to figure out, okay, how do I effectively replace these habits that I've always done, but in a um, long-term, like, sustainable way? Because like you said, you know, I think so often we go in and we're super excited about making this change. We know what we need to do, but then as soon as any sort of stress comes back, we go back to the original habit, right? So, um, you know, I'll get on a really good streak of sleeping super well, eating really healthy, and then school will get really overwhelming and I'll go right back to mm. eating fast food and not working out. And so what 
I've learned is that it's it's not a quick shift and to expect that is only setting yourself up for failure. So kind of what you were alluding to where, um, you know, if you really want to cut out soda, it might take a really long time to do that, but it's just small changes mm. and being committed to that. To create that real habit change, you have to slowly replace whatever that habit is with the new one and constantly reinforce that. Let's say for soda, for example, if you want to cut that out, instead of drinking that soda, if you came up with another thing and then found out, found a way to make that rewarding in a way. Yeah. When it comes to something like replacing soda with sparkling water, right? Mm -hmm. The problem I think is you have the cue, right? And then you switch the routine around mm -hmm. and it's kind of working with me for Sprite right now because there is sugar in Sprite. So I'm kind of decreasing that caffeine mm -hmm. now. It's just sugar. But if you switch to water, it doesn't have any sugar in there. So your reward is not this, like there's almost no reward unless mm -hmm. you kind of get like a good feeling from water, right? <laughs> but it feels super hydrated. But like maybe you drink a glass of water and then you get to play 10 minutes of video games or, you yeah. know, like something else that becomes another physical reward. Like you get dopamine from video games. So yeah. then that replaces that reward. There's something chemistry happening in your body that is replacing that caffeine and sugar reward you got from the soda. You yeah. Know? You kind of alluded to not completely restricting that so like the one m&m type of scenario that has been a really big help for me because when i try to restrict something i end up only craving it more later it's hard because you don't want to give into that craving every time but if you're so restrictive with it then you almost binge on it you know so that's why um, with the soda for example that kind of long-term plan to kind of cut it out it works more with how we work because like you said, those systems are already built in our mind. Our brain has learned that I like this. This makes me feel good. I want more of that. Mm -hmm. So to teach it not to do that, it takes time and time again of somehow replacing that with something else without, um, I don't know if I'm explaining it well, but, I'm trying to, cause like I noticed with myself, like, let's say like video games, for example, I stopped playing video games for like three months, right? Because it was getting too into my life. I wasn't working as much. It just wasn't good. And then I bought a Nintendo switch and I'm playing video games all the time again, but it, yeah. Cause those pathways in your brain are still there. They're right? still there. They won't go away. They'll come right That's back. That's the thing. But when I wasn't restrictive about it, when I, let myself just sit down and play a game, then I can just move on. There's always that potential of like getting lost in it. And I have to be really intentional about that and really self-aware of that. But we tend to really live in this restrictive mindset of like, I have to cut this out. This is bad. But that it's not in line with how our brain really works. Your brain isn't thinking, oh, this is bad. I need to stop this. It's thinking this makes me feel really good. I really like that. Mm -hmm. You know, our brains aren't, they're kind of simplistic in how that works sometimes. So it, if we really want to actually make those meaningful changes, we have to recreate new patterns in our brain, which is a long process and it's, you're going to fail a lot, but it's continually striving even through those failures of like, all right, I had a soda today, but it's not, I, I feel like the problem comes in when you want to do something and then you go against that and those negative thought patterns come back and then you feel really guilty about that. So you go back to the soda to feel better mm -hmm. when you're trying to quit and then you do it again, you feel so bad that it almost recreates those patterns. So your thoughts play a big part in that too. Just how you think about yourself doing that thing and kind of the guilt that we hold in that be aware of the thought patterns that arise before a behavior occurs that you don't like and, and after if and so what do you do with those thought like now what for me that's when meditation comes in 
Mm. And let's say I binged and got McDonald's and now I feel like crap. You know, it's my thoughts are telling me I knew I shouldn't have done this. I knew I was going to feel like this. Why did I do that? I'm not taking care of my body. But if I was to take a step back and be like, you know what? I had one burger. I've been working super hard. It's okay to have this little treat and Mm. kind of taking a step away from that guilt because that is what really gets me. I don't know if that's everybody's experience, but that's where I get stuck. Because then mm-hmm. that guilt makes me do something else to feel better about myself that may not be, you know, super healthy or productive. I guess maybe viewing it like a switch or something, like I either am the guy that drinks soda or I don't drink soda. Once you try not to drink soda and you and you do drink a soda, all that guilt and shame and those negative emotions that come with it, mm-hmm. if you lean into those, you're going to be like, Oh, I can't fix this. I'm just the guy that drinks soda, yep. you know. And if we want to make these gradual change changes that we're talking about, you need to be able to meditate on the emotions that come along with the behavior. And we'll jump into this in a minute, but I know a big part of meditation and analyzing your thoughts that way is to step away from like judging mm-hmm. your thoughts. Yeah. So if you can step away from judging your thoughts, then you'll be like, I guess, emotionally stable enough to make those gradual changes without Mm -hmm. hating yourself for the behavior you're trying to change. Yeah. It's almost like a switch from, I don't want to be a bad person for doing that to, I feel good of myself for doing this other thing, Mm. you know? So a less, I don't want to feel guilty to a more, I want to feel good. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, what were you saying? I was going to say, I, I want to talk about meditation. Let's swing back around to that. But I do want to dive into a couple more scenarios here. Mm-hmm. So with the, the, I brought up the soda because it was very clear cut to me. Coke to Sprite to sparkling water. Mm-hmm. Like I just replaced this behavior with it'll, it'll lead down to another drink. Right. So yeah. at the end of the day, I'm still drinking a drink. You mm-hmm. know, it's still the Close same. Close enough. Similar. Yeah. It's the, almost the same routine. Right. Mm-hmm. So what advice would you give to someone who wanted to like quit smoking? where Mm. the routine needs to completely go away. Like there needs to not be any smoke, you know, routine on the other end of this. How, what kind of gradual change do you think is a good in in that situation? For smoking, I think that, I think there's a lot of guilt involved there too, because most people I don't think are like super excited to say they're a smoker. It's kind of looked down upon. First, my personal process is um, thinking about how you perceive yourself in that. I think a lot of people take on the ideology of like, I'm a smoker. I'm a bad person. I don't take care of my health. It's There's so many negative images associated with that, that to really deal effectively with that, you kind of have to deal with that emotional side of things too. A big thing for a lot of people is dealing with stress effectively cigarettes just become such an easy method of that you know so like you were saying you have to find something to replace that with and smoking's tough because you know like you're saying with the soda you don't really want to pick up something similar to that habit because smoking's clearly not good that's what we're trying to get rid of so that makes it a little more complicated it's not as clear cut as a soda i think they have to find something whether that's fitness you know working out or just something to replace that with that is beneficial and in the soda scenario it's like you can slide down that same groove that habit Mm -hmm. pattern and just swap it out it's real easy you know where something like smoking you might have to go to the root cause of like okay why are we smoking because we're stressed out why are we stressed out how do we handle this stress right Mm -hmm. and Maybe we we start handling the with the stress with working out before we even quit smoking because you're not just sliding down the same habit pattern in your brain. You're gonna actually have to start forming a new pattern in your brain, mm-hmm. right? So maybe you get that exercise pattern down, right? And we're exercising, mm-hmm. we're dealing with our stress by exercising while we're still smoking until that groove starts getting down in our brain. Mm-hmm. Now we've mm-hmm. built the exercise habit up, and yeah. that's how we're handling stress. Now we quit smoking. Yeah. I'm saying because we handled our stress a different way and we set that in motion instead of just like, oh, quit smoking and you don't do anything to handle the stress. 
Yeah. You're going to make it like a week until you just jump back in because you don't have another stress handling mechani- mechanism in your brain that's ready to handle it when you do get stressed out. Yeah, I think that's a big part that so many people miss. You know, we we know what we have to do so much of the time, but I don't think we understand the full mechanism of actually figuring that out. So like in the smoking example, you know, what first caused them to start smoking? What is a big trigger for them? Stress related? Is it just a habit that they do? There's so many psychological factors there. There's clearly that physical addiction part. And that's something that kind of has to work on its own. That's, that's a whole separate thing. But the, the kind of mental side of that, I think people have to really realize that that's more of a lifestyle change than just like a quick habit to quit. Mm. You know, there's, there's so many other factors that feed into that habit that if those don't get addressed correctly, like you said, you're just going to go back to it, you know? Yeah. Cause smoking will get ingrained to everything in your life. So your cues for smoking might be when you're driving right after you eat, mm-hmm. before you take a shower, after you have a business meeting, like there's, yeah. it's not just going to be one cue you have to address. Exactly. It's a whole lifestyle switch up. Multifaceted. That's really going to, it is going to boil down to like figuring out the root of your stress, mm-hmm. why you started smoking, what's perpetuating it. All yeah. those, it's very, I guess it's very complicated. That's why it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to quit smoking, I guess. <laughs> it's funny because it, it actually reminds me of um, kind of what Caleb preaches about when getting into nutrition. It's it's not just a habit change or a diet. It's a lifestyle change. So, and I, I think that's where... Um, kind of that physical and mental both kind of play a part in that. It's like, if you really want to effectively change a habit, you have to consider everything that's going into it. You know, there's, Mm. like you said, there's so many different triggers for things. And a lot of times we're not even aware of most of those. We just pick up and do things, you know, I'll, I noticed I'll pick up my phone and just open Twitter right away. And then I'll be like, I don't even think I wanted to go on Twitter. You know, it's just, it becomes so second nature that if we don't really become aware of that and get to the root of that, of why is this the first thing I turn to? Is this really beneficial to me? And then plan, what better use of my time could I do? You know, instead of going on Twitter, maybe I can make some music and actually feel good about my time use. So that that's where kind of individual characteristics come in of what is your way of dealing with things. And that's, that's kind of why it's so complicated because each individual person is so unique and there's so many they each have their own stressors and their own factors but i still think there's a a kind of universal way that we react and how we can kind of combat that you know i don't know how much insight you're going to have in this topic but since this is fitness oriented podcasts or a lot more than that but there is a big theme of fitness right underlying every episode i was wondering through the lens of psychology how do you view fitness? Do you have any insights on what is even happening in our brain when we're working out? I don't want to say you can't have one without the other, but they both function better with each other. When I work out and I'm on a steady schedule, I do everything else more effectively. You know, I feel less stressed. Um, I feel more productive. I'm more focused. Physical health is so important to mental health because if you're not taking care of your body, you're not going to feel good about yourself. And then you're not going to be super engaged in what you're doing. They all play a part in each other. Like kind of the example earlier, like if I get fast food and don't work out for a week, I feel terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to go work on my projects or um, work on bettering myself. I just feel bad about myself. And then that makes me do more bad habits to counteract that. A good physical workout routine or regimen just staying active somehow helps everything else mentally we are at our best when we are getting our physical goals and taking care of our mental health you can't just have one the more i don't work out the mental health can get so bad sometimes that it couldn't be more clear to me how crucial that connection is yeah so it it definitely seems like exercise is something a therapist 
recommends yes, very often all when it comes time. to these mental health. Yeah, that's what I assume. And through some of our other conversations that seem to be held true. Do you think that exercise can ever be detrimental? Because I feel like for the most part, people who listen to my podcast probably like to work out or they wouldn't be attracted to this podcast. Do you ever see exercise actually hurt someone's mental health? Too much. I think too much of anything can be harmful. Mm -hmm. So I've seen people that would run for 11 miles every day. I don't know if that's necessarily bad, but I do think you can work out to a point of exhaustion where you're pushing your body too far, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And like I said, it's different for every person. I'm not an expert on what is the limit there, but um, I think that just kind of goes with anything. You can, you can always overdo it. You know, Mm -hmm. I've been injured many times because of um, either bad form or too much weight too fast. So that, that's another thing too, really pacing yourself, especially if you're kind of just getting started into that world. Yeah. That all holds up and that's true, but that is more about like wor- worrying about your physical health, right? Pacing yourself and all that stuff. It does, it's not really a mental health concern. I'm sure getting injured is going to hurt your mental health, you mm-hmm. know? But what I'm trying to get at is sometimes working out, it stresses people out even more. It's not the stress mm-hmm. reliever. Maybe you set a goal too high or something and they rely on it too much mm-hmm. as they want it to be the antidote to their mental health or whatever. It, it actually stresses them out and causes them as much as it's probably helping them, it might be stressing them out more than it's actually helping them. Is that something that you think happens? Yes. I've actually experienced that personally. And that's just more of setting too high goals sometimes because I've noticed with myself, I set a lot of goals and a lot of ranges and especially working out, you know, I want to get there at least four to five times a week. If I don't hit that, I feel really bad about myself. And I don't think that's good either. Part of me is like that motivates me to keep going. But then the other part is like, well, then I just feel like absolute crap. And it was more of me thinking about not hitting that goal than actually doing it. You know, maybe I still went three times that week and that was all that I could with my schedule. But now I feel bad because I didn't hit that. I think that is more of not necessarily strictly physical health, but just goal setting in general and kind of your how you deal with that stress setting up realistic expectations for yes. yourself and what you're going to accomplish yeah exactly because i i notice especially you know being in grad school right now with all this other stuff going on when i set too high fitness goals that just aren't achievable with what i'm doing right now it just sets me back mm-hmm. you know i'm not as on my game as i should be and that like you said that's supposed to be my stress reliever i think it's really beneficial to have multiple outlets so mm-hmm. whether that's journaling, working out, dancing, you know, it, there's so many different things. Yeah. I don't think anybody should just have one outlet. Yeah. You know, that way, if you go on vacation for a week and there's no mm-hmm. gym there, you won't go insane because exactly. you only rely on working out, you know, or mm-hmm. you won't, maybe you've worked out five days in a row, you get stressed out on the sixth day, you need to go to the gym and your body's not ready for it, but you mm-hmm. only have this one outlet of working out, you know, and so now you're pushing yourself too hard. That actually is interesting because that ties into an experience I've been going through recently of being okay with not always being a hundred percent. It's weird too, because in the therapist community, they harp that on us. You got to take care of yourself. You got to be aware of your own mental health. But as somebody who, you know, wants to do a lot, I really push myself and I find that I didn't always give myself that grace if I didn't hit those goals. Or if it's even, I need a day off today, I've been going too hard, giving myself that. You know, allowing that maybe today's just not your day and maybe your body really needs that rest. You know, that was something that was really hard for me to get to for so long because there was always that guilt of like, oh, you should be working on this. You know, you should be working towards that goal. But I realized when I give myself breaks, I'm more effective when I'm back, you know? So if I take a day off that next day, I'm on my game. Mm -hmm. But if I try and force myself to do it, it's just going to be half-assed. You know, it's not going to be what I would like it to be, but I'm still stressing about it. It's, it's just not even worth it. You Mm -hmm. know, 
Yeah, I um had a pretty high standard for like my my workout routines in college and after college I kind of fell off. I got a little bit out of shape and recently I've gotten back into shape and part of the way I've done that transition smoothly is making sure that I'm enjoying the gym, not yeah. just having it stress me out. And one thing that really worked for me is I wanted to do more cardio and when I first started it was very hard for me to get on the treadmill and run for, you know, over 15, 20 minutes. So I would do like 10 minutes on the treadmill and then I would go play basketball for like 30 minutes. Mm. I don't even like basketball, right? But I would just get out there and shoot hoops and stuff and just enjoy it, you know? Yeah. And for in your situation, like as a therapist, for someone who is having a mental health problem and they want to use exercise to fix their mental health problem, like they don't necessarily like to work out. I would definitely think that something like basketball or soccer or just a sport or an activity, yeah. something like that would be a much better outlet for them if exercise isn't their forefront goal. It's like mental health is my goal and mm -hmm. I'm using exercise to get there. It's like, well, you probably shouldn't go work out then. You should probably go play or do an activity that mm -hmm. you really enjoy. Yeah. You know, that also kind of gets you to break a sweat so that you're not adding an, another stressor to your life right now yeah. you know if the gym stresses you out like you don't have to go lift weights or run on a treadmill there's a bunch of other activities that might not be as efficient as running on a treadmill but they're just gonna be more sustainable for you yeah you're more willing to do it in those days where you just don't feel like getting out there you know i think that's such a important distinction that we need to make because i think when so many people think of working out they just think of going to the gym, lifting weights, you know, running on the treadmill. But like you said, there's so many other things. You know, you could go join a dance class, go do some yoga. There's so many activities out there that you can find a way to enjoy it and still be active. So kind of to your point, I think that should be encouraged more of like, you know, find your activity. That doesn't have to be what I like to do because that's what's helped me. What what are you passionate about? What do you like to do? I think that that's a really interesting idea because for so much of us or so many of us, I think we think we have to work out. It's on our to-do list. You know, it's one of those like, got to check that box. But like you said, it should be more of, I'm excited to do this because it's good for me and I'm going to feel good about it. There should be more of that excitement rather than that feeling of like, oh, I have to go to the gym. You know, like you should be able to find some activity that really gets you excited to be there, that you're not, when those stressful days come, it really truly is um, an actual outlet. And that that's something that we've been talking about a lot in a lot of my classes of just finding what actually helps you. You know, so often on our off days, we turn to Netflix or video games. We have these default, like, okay, this is where I take a break. You know, this is how I rest. And those, I think there's appropriate times for that. I don't think that's bad, but sometimes it's not really refreshing. You know, like sometimes you really needed to just go for a walk or draw or write in your journal. It's like, we have these things that we tend to just always go towards, but it's we need to kind of figure out, like, what do I actually need today? You know, what activity can I do that is going to feel fulfilling? I'm going to come out of that happier and more energized than I went into it. You know, that's I don't think we consider that a lot. It, we kind of just do. We're not as intentional as I think we should be. So basically... Pay attention to the activities that you lean on and maybe put some more intent behind the ones you choose and pick ones that at least have a little bit of positive benefit to your life so that when you're down, you're not just doing nothing for yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, at least considering that maybe today I just need to watch Netflix. I, I can't do anything. I'm just too stressed out. But maybe Netflix isn't really going to solve my problem. You know, maybe there's another, like maybe I really just need to go for a walk for a second and come back and look at it from a fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. um, just having more options there and trying 
in that moment, like what's actually going to, what do I really need right now? Mm -hmm. You know, kind of asking yourself that question. Yeah. I tend to lean towards those activities. If there is a benefit, one video game I got into was Pokemon Go because at least it's going to make me walk around the neighborhood. Yeah. I tend to watch Netflix if it's with my girlfriend because at least I'm spending quality time with someone. Yeah, exactly. I I like to play Fortnite with you guys when I was living at my mom's house because at least I'm connecting with people that I need to keep yeah. up in touch with, you know? So maybe just looking for, not an excuse, but right, at least one good reason to do this activity where if you're just alone yeah. watching Netflix doing nothing, you're not connecting with a person, you're mm-hmm. not doing anything for your mental, physical body, any, you know what I'm saying? It might not be as fun, right? But drawing a picture alone might actually give you some creative outlet mm-hmm. and it might be more boring, right? <laughs> but if you just wait and only watch a Netflix or a movie with somebody, then, yeah. then you are at least connecting with somebody getting something more out of that or like if it's a documentary on netflix or you know what i'm saying something something that at least ties in and gives you a little bit more meaning than just having like zone out nothing time you know <laughs> yeah and i think there's a place for nothing time i think we are so like stressed all the time and just constantly going that our brains do need a break sometimes but like you're saying like it shouldn't be every time, mm-hmm. you know, I shouldn't just every time I come home, just pop open Netflix, check out for the day. Cause then at the end of that, then I just feel lethargic and lazy and, you know, I'm guilting myself for wasting that time when, and maybe if I had made music, I would have come out of that. Like, wow, I felt super productive. I expressed myself, you know, and whatever that is, everybody has, there's so many different outlets nowadays, but I think just taking that second before you jump into something to just create that habit of thinking like, is this what I need to be doing right now? Is this going to help me? Um, is this helping me get towards my goal? Or even if, if your goal is just to relax in that moment, is this really going to get me there? You Mm -hmm. know, so kind of just checking in with yourself of like, what do I need and what's going to get me to that place? Yeah. I think there is a way to live a life where everything has a purpose and everything is intentional. Yeah. Like you're saying, even your downtime, you're like, no, I'm relaxing right now. Mm-hmm. This is intentional, you know? Yeah. It's exactly. not just getting caught in like a four hour Netflix loop, mm-hmm. right? And there's no way by hour three, you're like, I, I still needed three hours of relaxing, <laughs> yeah. you know? But if I'm intentionally watching one hour of Netflix for my relaxation hour, you yeah. know? And I think, I think there is a schedule that fits in where every single moment of your day is whether it's relaxing or fitness or helping you become more productive or successful, everything you do does play at least some small role into whatever your big goal in life is, right? Wherever you're heading, whatever your destiny is, there's no moment that is pulling you in the other direction, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point because even those down moments are helping you recover to be more effective in those other moments. But we... I feel like we so often just throw those to the side as like, ah, if I have time, I'll do it, you know, but those self-care practices are what, like you said, they're, if we're intentional about them, they can feed into that larger goal. Mm -hmm. That may not be what I want to do, but it can help me more effectively do that later, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about meditation. Meditation is one of the things in life that I adore, I love. I'm like almost passionate about that I don't do. <laughs> I'm so bad at <laughs> meditating. Hilarious. You know, I'll do like a quick two minutes or something, but man, I cannot sit down for 15 minutes in, so alone hard. in a room with nothing else going on. Like I always have a podcast or something blasting in my ear and I just, I don't know. I guess I'm just left alone with that existential dread and it's just, I just always get up and do something. Always. I'm always doing something. The car ride here, I couldn't possibly spend 10 minutes that car ride with no music or not. You know what I'm saying? It had to be podcast the whole way here. Yep. I'm sure many, many, many listeners at home are doing the same thing. They might be alone and they just don't want to be alone with their thoughts, right? It's scary. Meditation, it seems like the easiest thing in the world, but it scares the fuck out of me. <laughs> so you are someone I always 
really looked up to in this regard, and I really love your passion for meditation. Uh, in your own words, what does meditation, what does it mean to you? How has it played a role in your life? I think meditation gets such, not a bad rap, but such a misconstrued understanding. Mm -hmm. it, it's presented as this like super wooey, spiritual, like nobody really understands it, but like if you get it, you get it. But in reality, it's just like, <laughs> just being present, you know, being aware, being intentional. The way I think about it is sitting here with your thoughts and just trying to watch them and be aware of them. Notice how my body reacts to them. Um, notice what I latch on to, you know, different patterns that come up. So for me, the way I would describe it is just a presence with awareness an intentional presence, I guess. So I like to meditate in the mornings mostly. I'll do it throughout the day too, especially if I'm feeling really stressed. But it, it just gives me, it's the only time of that day that I'm not being triggered by something. You know, there's not some stimulus that is latching on to me or that I need to pay attention to. I, it's the one time that I get to check in with myself and say, how am I feeling? What am I thinking about? You know, am I stressed? Am I anxious? I feel like people think about it as if it's this like, you meditate and you become this like super wise, all knowing, like you get it, you know? And I th that meditational state is definitely something unlike anything else. Like it, it takes you to a place of just relaxation and peace and you kind of feel this connection that you can't really explain, but it it's one of those things where it's like when you get there, you're like, I see, I get it now. I see what they've been saying. I understand the principles perfectly. Like I understand it like on paper, I guess, but you're supposed to like have a, a thought that's bugging you that you cling to. Right. And then like let go of it. And I, really have a hard time letting go of certain things super for instance hard. last night i might not be able to sleep because i'm thinking about this podcast and i'm like mm -hmm. oh gotta do well on the podcast gotta do well on the podcast something like that will get will weigh so heavy on my brain that if i meditate i'll just think about the podcast the whole 15 minutes you know what i'm saying i get mm -hmm. stuck and i don't i don't have the ability to be like podcast tomorrow i'm worried about that it's stressing me out move on to the next thought it's like i can't i whatever's bugging me the most whatever is really the most present on my brain the whole meditation session will be about that and i stuck. won't i yeah i'll get stuck and i won't be able to shift through that to get to my other problems like i won't mm. be able to dive inwards past whatever my most troubling situation is that makes sense and i think that's where a lot of people get stuck because we're so used to thinking all day that we don't know how to stop you know, we're, we've become so busy and we're just constantly doing stuff that we don't know how to not do anything. That's kind of how I think about meditation sometimes, learning how to just sit still and not do anything because so much of the day going from this task to this task and then it's like I'm constantly thinking and stressing and, and taking all this stuff in. Meditation is a way to process that and to just sit with it and be like, okay, this is here. I acknowledge it. Now I'm going to let go. And that's really hard. I was, yeah, really, really hard. Oh, thanks Frank. Now I get it. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, that's the question is, is how do I let go? Do you have any advice or things that you do that help you let go of that big problem that you're stuck on or that thing? You know, that it's actually something I struggle a lot with too. And I don't, I don't know if that's ever something that we're completely freed from. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's ever a point where it's like, I have complete control over my mind. I can do whatever I want, think whatever I want. But I think it's just a process of practicing that. What I did to start was um, guided meditations on YouTube because I needed some stimulus initially. So that it, you could do like a five, 10 minute one where somebody's just guiding you on kind of what you're doing and how to be in that space. Mm -hmm. And that is a really good starting point, I think, because we don't know how to not think. 
And the more that you try not to think about something, your brain's just going to latch onto that even more. Mm-hmm. It's kind of this irony of like, the more we try to meditate, the more we start thinking about things. Yeah. So it's, you know, I don't want to tell you just stop, just let it go. But like, it's almost kind of how it is. You know, you just kind of have to learn that skill of just practicing it over and over again of I'm obsessing over this. How do I like, let me try and take that step back and just see it and see what else comes up, you know? Maybe just like with those habits, right? Since maybe I view it more of like an on and off button, like Mm -hmm. a switch. Let me try to meditate. Oh, I'm really not good at this. I'm going to stop doing it. Maybe I just have to pencil in 10 minutes a day yeah. and go through weeks of of terrible meditation mm-hmm. and sitting on that thought that I can't get over and just sitting on it week after week until I learn, right? I mean, that's probably why I'm not getting better is because I get intimidated and I don't actually put in the time mm-hmm. because why mm-hmm. put in the time? I'm not good at it. And it's funny because I'm, I'm not scared to suck at something. I'm not scared to fail. I like to fail. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Failing to meditate is for some reason <laughs> just the worst feeling. It's like, I can do all these things, right? I'm smart. I can get a job. I can go to school. I can start a but company. I but I, I can't <laughs> think right. I can't stop. You know, it's like not a very fun failure. You know? Yeah. There's like a learning. There's something to learn from every other failure. But like controlling your own thoughts. It's what like do, what do I basic thing. Yeah, Why what can't do I do, I do this? Yeah. What do I do with this failure? You know, yeah. I don't know. It's See, that. that's where my problem with the way that meditation gets presented to the general public is. Because the way that I've experienced it and the way that it gets talked about a lot is very different Mm -hmm. because most of my meditations are probably not that super clear headed. Like I'm probably thinking through most of them. Mm -hmm. And then there's maybe that one moment where I can take a step back. A thought probably comes in another 10 seconds. You know, Mm -hmm. it's I fail probably most of my meditations, but it's that continued effort and that practice that. Maybe I get just a little bit better every time. Yeah. You know, I get a little bit more relaxed. I'm a little more aware of my thoughts. It's not just like a, oh, I go from zero to Zen master in a day. You know, it's it's a long process. So if you do a meditation for 15 minutes, you're just stuck on one thing and you, it doesn't go well. Mm-hmm. You still leave that 15 minutes feeling better about your day and you're still like, I try. No, not every time. There's definitely times where I'm like. I just wasted 15 minutes. Yeah. That's you know? how, yeah. <laughs> like that was dumb. <laughs> yeah. I could have been doing anything else. I just sat here and thought, why did I do that? Hmm. And that goes back to that after judgment of like guilt. Oh, why did hmm. I do that? You know, that's where I think the opportunity to create those changes is. Cause at least for me, I noticed that that guilt is what makes me not want to do it again mm, yeah. you know because i felt like i just wasted my time why would i do this again yeah. but if i in that moment if i can shift it from i failed to well at least i tried and i practiced and i was intentional about it and this isn't going to be a quick fix it's going to take time it it's kind of that more realistic of like this isn't going to be a quick fix you know it's a long-term change mm-hmm. and then it, it's funny you say that it's like you feel almost guilty for not being able to do it but I would say 99% of people are the same way. You know, we don't know how to not think. Mm. It's yeah. not like we're taught that in school. I feel guilt and then like shame and then discouraged. Yeah. Cause every it, time I try. It, it seems so basic. But in reality, it's a really, really hard skill to learn that takes hours of practice. You know, years. Yeah, honestly, dude, monks used to just sit and meditate all day every day i cannot do that it's it's something that you got to just get used to that uncomfortableness you know yeah so i think good takeaways would be the guided meditation Mm -hmm. because i do think podcasting and like stand up it's like you're kind of letting someone think for you Mm -hmm. so i but you're kind of ramping up with it you know yeah oh yeah 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 you know (laughs) instead of like i guess a guided meditation is like a calming podcast of tranquil let me think for you kind yeah. of energy going on. Just a little guidance. And then the no. last thing I want to touch on is, isn't br- br- like your breathing super important? Like, yes. do you have any breathing tips? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's my anchor into meditation. And that that's where I think it gets overcomplicated when it shouldn't. 
like for me, I will sit there and just count my breaths in and out. So I'll do like a one, two, three, four, five each way. And it's so simple, but it, it gives me something to focus on. It gives my mind a focal point, you know, cause I, I think that's where we tend to get super distracted when we're just sitting there and our mind is so used to thinking about things. It has to f- focus on something. So when I focus just on my breath and my counting, it gives me that kind of grounding to be like, okay, this is what is important right now. This is what I need to focus on Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, just sitting there and trying to do it with no, nothing to kind of bring you back to that. You're just going to get lost, you know? So I, I like to do, um, there's a few guided meditations on that too, of just, slow in count five slow exhale five and i find that's a great starter because it it feels natural it's kind of the rhythm that we do without really thinking about it so it it taps into something that comes without even thinking about it and then you can kind of build that skill on that you know so it you're kind of building on something that is already within you and you're building a skill on top of that if that makes sense no it does that's that's (laughs) fucking dope (laughs) <laughs> yes. This next thing might get a little woo woo We've been friends for a while, and during our freshman year of college, you is when you really got into meditation, and then mm-hmm. there was a moment where you were like, dude, I opened up my third eye, right? <laughs> and I, what's the gland called? Uh, pineal gland. The pineal gland. So mm-hmm. I guess there's this pineal gland, and if you meditate enough, it kind of gets activated. So Can you the, explain all? Yeah. Basically, the conspiracy, if you want to call it, is that um, fluoride calcifies the pineal gland, which I guess that means that it's not as accessible, it's not operationable, kind of closes it off. What the pineal gland physiologically does is releases melatonin. But there's, you know, it goes back all the way to, I want to say, Egypt. Like the Egyptians, they were really big on the pineal gland being a symbol for what's called the third eye, which um, they say is basically, I think it's like the the seat of the soul or something like that, where um, the way that it was described as if that's, it's kind of like you're almost like a psychic connection to the world, or it's like, it's definitely super woo-woo-y, but in stuff that I've experienced, I can also kind of see of like, maybe there's something to that, you know? It's it's one of those things where when you say it, it sounds ridiculous and you know it sounds ridiculous, but those experiences that you've gone through are something that you can't ignore. You know, it's, it's something that it's like, ah, I know if I say this, everybody's going to think I'm a quack. You're freaking crazy, <laughs> you're bro. You're crazy. <laughs> but there's that feeling that you're just like, there might be something deeper to this. Okay, so what did it feel like? What happened when you uh, activated your pineal gland or you opened up your third eye? What what led to that and what did it feel like? So I guess the first time that I had like a really good meditation, really deep into it, first time I really felt a kind of spiritual connection, I was sitting there meditating And all of a sudden, there was just intense peace that came over me. Like, I've never felt before in my life. You know, there's usually at least a little bit of stress or anxiety that's always kind of present. This was the first time I was completely just content with where I was. And it was this overbearing feeling of like, maybe I am connected to something deeper. You know, maybe there is more than what we see on this kind of surface level. And there's really strong energy or vibration going. I don't know how you want to describe it, but... (laughs) Sounds cool. (laughs) It sounds crazy. But it it was almost like you could just feel this like pulsating there almost, you know? And it was super weird. And I there's a while where I was just like, that was just some, you know, I was just in a good meditational state. There's nothing more to that. But as the years have gone on and I've studied it a little bit and tried to understand it, it just seems like the third eye is, I don't want to say a symbol, but like for me, that is, that's kind of what I think of when I think of spirituality, 
you know, most people maybe are religious or associate with some other sort of kind of spiritual connection. That's where I find mine. You know, that it's almost like that is the way that I don't even know how to explain this. That's fine. It seems <laughs> it seems a little bit unexplainable, right? It is. It's a hundred percent unexplainable. So that's that's totally valid, man. What let's let's talk then about fluoride. What like did you stop using fluoride then, or is no. that okay? It's, it's See, a, that's that's one of those things that over the years I'm kind of go back and forth on. Is it a conspiracy? Is there grounding to it? I don't know at this point. I try to at least be conscious of like not drinking absorbent amount of tap water or um, maybe getting some toothpaste that's a little less fluoride. Um, but there is, you know, it does help with teeth and it, I don't know if it's, if there's as much grounds to that as I used to think, but I also, it, it could be, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, it's hard to have hard evidence on that. Mm. It's hard to study that, you know? So, okay. And once you, kind of went through that process, right? I know it's kind of hard to explain what it felt like and what meditating during it felt like, but mm -hmm. how, what, how did that affect your life? How did that take shape in your life? What changes did you notice as you, as a person after that moment? I changed completely. <laughs> I'm nowhere near the same person I was before that. And that, that could be just meditation in general. It, I don't want to say I was a mean person. I don't think I was mean necessarily, but I was way more intentional about how I interacted with people after that. Those experiences kind of showed me just how kind of interconnected people are. Like there was this connection that I felt to just everything that it was almost like I felt like I had to treat people with respect. Because it was like, if I am really connected to these, then I, it's almost like treating myself with respect. You know, it's, it's that kind of spiritual idea of um, karma, I guess, if you want to call it, of just like everything you put out comes back to you. It just made me think about those things in ways that I never had before. Like I grew up religious around spiritual ideas, but that was the first time I had felt spiritual. I'd mm -hmm. felt any sort of connection to something. So you felt connected to um, life or the earth or mm -hmm. everything in general and that made you more sympathetic towards other people mm -hmm. maybe you could see yourself in their shoes easier or when you were like mean to someone or nice to someone it almost felt like you were being mean or nice to yourself in a way like yeah. like, like your actions were being received as well mm -hmm. since you did feel some sort of gl not global but universal connection mm -hmm. to life i guess right yeah kind of wow. just showed me just how i guess sensitive people are too like when i got to such a raw state of emotion it just shows you just how powerful little things are you know you just become extra attuned to every thought that comes in and how that affects you and then that makes you think well if my own thoughts affect me that much how much do my words affect other people you know it, it just kind of that awareness starts to take hold in everything you do and is kind of the driving force of how you behave and interact with people. It sounds like a spiritual awakening, right? Yeah, 100%. Does, once you have the spiritual awakening, I know that you feel connected to everything and everybody, but does that also feel like it drives some sort of separation between you and everyone else? Does everyone else kind of feel like zombies or asleep mm. or not really paying attention to this thing that you're tapped into i think that's a big issue that i know i went through it and i think a lot of people when they initially start going through that it's almost like you feel like you're more spiritual like oh i care i'm super conscious i'm super intentional about things you're just eating chips and you don't care about stuff but like you said that's such a disconnection you know that's not building true meaningful bonds that's me putting you down so it i think that's kind of the danger side of it. It can, you can almost get like a sort of spiritual ego of like, I meditate, I'm super healthy, you know, it's like, and that's a really dangerous mindset to fall into. Mm -hmm. I fell into that pretty hard. And once I started coming out of that and realizing like, 
I'm just being an asshole, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> acting as if I'm this great person, uh, which is just like, yeah, that's just even worse almost, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really tricky because I think in order to live a healthy life, whether it's mental health, physical health, spirituality, anything, you almost have to judge other people that don't do that. Say it's junk food. If you don't judge other people for eating junk food if you're like oh that's fine they do that eventually you're just going to want to eat junk food right yeah if you don't almost judge people for not meditating like oh it's fine if you don't meditate well then why are you meditating What's right the incentive it, yeah it's really hard to make any progress anywhere in any of these categories we've talked about without kind of looking down on the people that don't or el- like it or else you're not gonna sustain your healthy habit and you know yeah. it's 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 even with like a spiritual thing right mm-hmm. it must be kind of tricky to feel that and tell and say that it's okay that no one else has tapped into this like it's not okay i guess if you think it's <laughs> yeah. so great you know like they should get their shit together and <laughs> meditate everybody more. should be doing this they should right i mean i, I wish <laughs> i mean that's why we're here man but that, that that brings up an interesting concept of just like it's once you have that awareness and kind of hit that point, it's how do I integrate this in a way that is not judgmental, but is also encouraging more positive things. Mm. So it it's a really hard line. Like you said, like if I am just like, you don't have to work out, you don't have to eat healthy. That's all cool and good. Then why, why would you, you know, mm. what's the point if there's no incentive for to do that? But I think that's a trap that people have fallen into a lot. I know I definitely have. All right, I got a trick question for you. It's a doozy. Do you think that you are enlightened? No. Why? <laughs> um, you didn't fall for my trick. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> no, it's good. That's good. <laughs> I, I don't know if... I don't know, because you know, like, Eckhart Tolle and all these kind of spiritual teachers, they talk about enlightenment as if it's this place that you hit and then you're just good, right? I don't know if I'm just not good at meditating, but I've not hit that place. (laughs) Well, do you think you touch on moments of enlightenment? Yeah, and that goes back to um, that quote I said earlier where um, enlightenment is not imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. I think to be fully enlightened, you have to really go into those uncomfortable places of yourself. And that's what I'm figuring out right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I, when I first started meditating, it was all light and it was all good. And I felt so good about myself. I felt so good about the world. I was making all these positive changes, but I got so caught up in the positivity that I tried to deny any sort of negativity. You know, Mm -hmm. any bad feelings that came up, any stress, it was like, no, 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 this is interrupting my peaceful lifestyle. When Mm -hmm. really it should be, this is a part of human life. How do I actually adapt to this instead of just avoiding it? So it's almost like my enlightenment was really just an avoidance behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't dealing with the real stressors in my life. So now I'm at a point where it's like, I've, I've gotten the light. I've seen the really good stuff about myself. I need to figure out the really bad. You know, I know it's there, but now I need to actually process and figure out how do I acknowledge and integrate without repressing and denying. Do you think enlightenment is obtainable? Do you think there are people who are like straight up enlightened? Or do you think it's more of like, it's not like a switch that you hit. It's like more of something you can never quite like get to. I've always wondered that, you know, because it's not like life just, you don't have stressors, you know, there's always going to be something, but I guess there is, you could get to a point where your mindset is just able to adapt and handle those things. But I don't know. It's that concept just doesn't feel realistic to me anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to always think that there was this great, super peaceful place where you're just going through life and you can handle everything that comes at you. You don't stress too hard. But I, I don't even know if that's healthy, mm-hmm. you know, because I don't think it's healthy to overstress. But I've definitely noticed in those moments where I've gotten to that breaking point, it's forced me to deal with those things. And then I'd change my life around. Whereas if 
I was just, everything was good and I didn't deal with it and actually acknowledge that part of myself, I don't think I ever would have changed, you know? So you had to have certain things happen to you before you could even like make progress in certain areas. Mm -hmm. So what maybe not, maybe it's almost impossible for uh, like enlightenment theoretically is possible, but no one human could go through all of the different trials that it would take like in one lifetime or something. Yeah. I mean, in every situation that would bring out every side of yourself to, to like deal uh, with. I see and, what you're saying. You see, yeah. 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 I guess that goes back to the whole idea of like reincarnation and, um, in the Buddhist philosophy, that's basically you keep getting reincarnated until you've hit all of that and you become yeah. enlightened. You figure you've gone through every different thing you could go through and then you're a whole being, you know? I don't know where I subscribe to on that, but I don't want to say it's impossible. I don't think anything's impossible, but it's just so hard for me to, to think of a life just stress-free, you mm -hmm. know, I would love that. And that sounds so great, but I feel like for so long, I was so focused on obtaining that, that I missed out on the good and bad around me, you know, mm -hmm. I was so lost in that dream of enlightenment that I wasn't actually present. Yeah. It's interesting because like when I asked a question, I was thinking like if there was someone who was enlightened, it would probably be the monk who spent his whole life in the cave meditating. But you were also saying that it took certain situations to bring out a darkness in you that you had to deal mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and that furthered your path along enlightenment. But the monk in the cave isn't getting tested by all these other situations. Like, like how is he even pinpointing certain parts of himself without going through more experiences you know yeah. like i don't it doesn't <laughs> even he is is missing something there you know mm -hmm. it's interesting yeah that that is a an interesting point because i guess you could argue that they're battling their own internal thoughts but that's so different than actually experiencing real life stressors in front of you that you mm -hmm. can't get away from you yeah. know like you have to pay those bills or um there's just some things in life that you have to deal with and acknowledge and like you said like if i was just by myself isolated just you know becoming enlightened all the time i don't i don't know how that would work out that's a that seems to be the method that historically has always been towards enlightenment um which is really interesting now that you say that because it, it doesn't really work with the reality of what we've experienced you know mm -hmm. Yeah, I was um, reading a book about motivation, and they're talking about like internal motivation versus external motivation, right? So like external, you're motivated by like rewards and stuff, and you know, in order to be internally motivated, like get a sense of accomplishment from within, you need to like pursue mastery, right? Mm -hmm. And mastery can never—it's kind of unobtainable, right? You mm -hmm. can never any skill you can think of, right? You want to be the best at it, you can never possibly be the like you can never possibly completely master it mm -hmm. so it's that pursuit of mastery that gives you that internal motivation right like mm -hmm. that internal sense of um accomplishment and like you have a valuable life right and i wonder if enlightenment is like almost a synonym for master mastery or mm -hmm. it's similar in the way where it's like it's all about the pursuit like the pursuit of enlightenment is enlightenment you're not going to get there and understanding that, but still pursuing that, that's what being enlightened really is. Yeah, that sits a lot better with me. Because mm -hmm. that is like, you, you're you realistic about like, okay, I may never hit this, but I'm going to do everything I can to at least get as close as possible. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, I feel like, sets you up better for um, not failing. Because when you... Or f when you're facing the expectation of I'm going to be enlightened and then you're stressed about, you know, some bills you got to pay that day, it doesn't really sit too well together. No. You know, <laughs> like, why should I pay these bills? I need to get enlightenment. You mm -hmm. know, that's what my focus should be. But if it's I may never achieve this, but I'm, I'm going to try my damn best. That's a completely it's a more realistic and just like I feel like a much better way of going about it. You know, mm -hmm. it when those little setbacks come, it's like, I didn't say I was going to master it. Yeah. And now I'm just working towards it. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think we're going to wrap up kind of soon. Do you have any final remarks or things that we missed about mental health or psychology that you think is important to just 
bring up or maybe reiterate, you know, just some key lesson or understanding that you would like to share? One big thing in mental health that I don't know if it gets overlooked necessarily, but I think individually we miss this when we're going through that process is um, being patient with yourself and setting realistic goals for those changes because um, I know my own personal journey of trying to make better habits, you know, I've failed so many times. And if I took those failures to be that final, this is it. There's no, you know, I I tried and I failed. Um, I wouldn't be close to where I am today. You know, it's all about being patient with yourself and committed to that process, but also um, having grace with yourself and being okay with that failure, but at least giving yourself credit for trying. I learned from my own personal journey, it's, I'm really tough on myself and I'm a counselor. You know, if my job is to be empathetic to other people and I'm so hard on myself, imagine how the average person is. So being patient with yourself and, you know, giving yourself that time to grow and change. And if you mess up, not just beating yourself down about it, because that's what continues that cycle. You know, I I really do think that um, showing yourself that self-love and really trying to show yourself that you are making positive changes and you are taking steps to actually implement something that you care about is a really hard process. It's not a quick fix and it's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult, but I think reminding yourself that you're doing this because you care about yourself and because you're trying to better yourself and focusing on, you know, those efforts and instead of focusing on failing and messing up, then that's what's going to keep pushing you when you fail, you know, looking at the end goal and, just realizing that we're not going to be perfect. We're going to mess up a lot. It's the human way. But if you if your expectation is to hit that mark every time and if you just beat yourself up every time you don't, you're just going to keep going through that cycle. You know, figuring out a way to um just be empathetic with yourself and and realize you're human. You're going to mess up, but it doesn't make you a bad person. You're still trying. And that's that's what matters at the end of the day, you know? It's continued effort. Yes. <laughs> that was absolutely beautiful, man. It's been a complete honor to have you on the podcast. Uh, you are just a fucking awesome person, dude. And the world needs more Frank Marazas. I'm not kidding. Thank you. I really appreciate that, man. Thanks for coming all the way down or up here to, to visit. <laughs> I've been wait, waiting for this for a long time, but I mean, this was well worth the wait. It was worth it for sure, man. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Once again, thank you, Frank, who also makes the intro beat to the podcast. Me and Frank have another episode that is available on our Patreon account. So if you really enjoyed today's episode, I would ask that you please go check us out at patreon.com slash drive fitness, where me and Frank have a whole nother discussion. And once again, if you want to support the podcast, please check out our merchandise at drive fitness.